This week, we're beginning to talk about community. We spoke about uh, prayer. We spoke about worship. Now we're speaking about community. And I really struggled to write this message. I, I had a hard time putting this message together, uh, which is alarming because community is one of those easy things that you should be able to come up with a sermon on uh, as a pastor. And I told somebody during the week, they said, hey, how's the sermon going? I was like, well, I don't have one yet. And they're like, what are you preaching on? I'm like, community. And they're like, oh, it's, you know, a little bit alarming. You should have one there. And it's not that I didn't have any content. I had tons of content. Uh, in fact, I probably have three, four hours worth of content that I could talk about with community. But I just couldn't find the thing that God was saying, like, yes, that's the thing that, that I want you to talk about. That's, that's what I want this crowd, what I want your church to hear. And the way that it works between me and God is if I don't have some kind of confirmation from Him, then I don't preach it. I don't get up and tell you guys it's not my agenda. I, I kind of submit all that to God and say, okay, God, is this okay? Is this what you would have me to talk about? And He'll shape and He'll kind of push and mold and, and turn that thing. Uh, but Monday came and went. Tuesday came and went. Wednesday came and was winting. It was going. And I was like, <clears throat> okay, God, you know, Sunday's coming, you know, no matter what. And, um, and it, in, on Wednesday afternoon, I was here, and God just really put this into my, into my heart. This, I knew that we were talking about community. But instead of pushing towards join a community group or don't do life alone, we want to do life together with somebody, God kind of pulled me in a bit of a different direction and, and brought me into uh, this picture actually inspired some of it. I was scrolling around on the internet and found this. And Can everyone remember where you were in 1995 when... At the uh, yeah, at the stadium. I asked one of our elders and he was like, I was at a bar, you know. But um, yeah, that was a long time ago though, right? You know, long, long time ago. So, the, the, yeah, 1995... Uh, when, and you'll have to forgive me if, if you're new here. Um, I just want you to know that, that, yes, I don't sound like a South African because I'm not from the States, but this is home. We live here. Um, but I am very much an outsider, and this country has been through a lot. I mean, what, what's behind this picture? I mean, uh, this is uh, Nelson Mandela giving the, the Ellis Cup trophy over to Francois Pinar. And in, in this moment here, three years prior to that, uh, South Africa had been allowed back into rugby after, uh, you know, a, apartheid. And I, I just, I'm, I'm very, very careful because I didn't grow up in this. And, and I, I just want you to know that I'm not ever going to try and say that, well, I can understand what some of you went through or I can relate to what some of you went through. I'm not even going to try and pretend to do that. Instead, I, I look at it, I take this approach, and so I appreciate any grace that you can extend to me if I need it. But of what can I learn from the past? What can I learn from your experiences? What, what is it that I can learn from what this country has been through and where it's continuing to go? And as I, as I looked at this picture and I, I read about the history of this, one of the things that I felt like I could learn was that there was a man here, President Mandela, that fought really, really hard for this country and did a lot of really amazing things. And I know this is a gross oversimplification of it. But I just can't help but think that, that this was a really amazing moment in the history of, of your country, of this country. And that it was a moment worth celebrating. And I wasn't here for this, but I remember hearing when Sia Khaleesi was named the captain of the rugby team, you know, and, and how impactful that was on people. And I felt like that was, you know, everyone was talking about how amazing that was and the positive impact that it had and what it represented for the nation and the country. And, and, and so I can't even imagine what this would have been like to have lived through this here. But I, I can learn that the this country is built upon people that have never stopped and will never stop and will never give up for the good of the Rainbow Nation, for the good of the community that is South Africa. Now, I pulled a quote from Mr. Mandela here, and it says, A fundamental concern for others in our, a funda let me start over, a fundamental concern for others in our individual and community lives would go a long way and making the world a better place that we so passionately dream of. I feel like that 
this is a man that dreamt of a better place. And I would say that everyone in here dreams of a better place. And I like that he said what resonated with me on this is that fundamental concern for the individual and also for the community. And so how do we continue the work that has been done up until this point to create a better community for us, for our, for our nation, for our neighbors to live in? How do we create a better community for the next generation, for our kids and our kids' kids, for them to grow up into it? And I'm not going to pretend that, okay, well, that I'm going to say, well, here's your answer. Do these three things, and then it's done. Because that, that's what would make a good sermon. Here's three ways that we can solve all the problems in South Africa. Jesus, Jesus, and Jesus. Let's go have coffee. That could be it. That's not what this is about. But I, I hope that this is a message, and I, I mean, it was from God, that can inspire you guys and can inspire us as a church. Because community is a beautiful thing. It's so beautiful that people fought and they gave their lives for it, not just here, but all over the world. And it leads me to think, what... What in the wake of some of the things that are happening across the nation? You've got a, a thing running through the schools right now. Um, you know, and, and the issue in the schools is not so much the students, but what's, what's happening behind and behind and behind and behind all of that? You just have hurt people. There's hurt people that's hurting more people. And so if we want to build beyond this and build through this and build past this then how do we build a better community and there's not just one answer that solves all of it but the question that that I would kind of set us up for this for in this message here is is this is what if community was so good that it was irresistible all right just want to pause and for us to think about that so what if let, let's break it down into a smaller uh, a smaller bit, something that we can understand, something that's manageable. All right, what if uh, this community here, this church, was so good that it was irresistible? What would that mean? That would mean that this would be a place for people to come and that when they would come and interact with our community, they would say, that's really great. I want more of that. I want to be a part of that. Or I don't quite understand what all was going on there, but it was something really nice. It was something really good. I think I want to come back and be a part of that again. So that, that's the easy context is church. But what about our neighborhoods? What about government? What about our provinces? What about our cities? What about our schools? How, what if community worked in a way that God intended it, but worked in a way that it was irresistible? How much better would that be? I, I mean, that's sort of a no-brainer. I feel like Everything would be a lot better that way. You know what the, the sad thing is about church and church community? Is if, if we do our part wrong, people get hurt. You know, if you get cold chicken at KFC, you're probably still going to go back to KFC. They can do their job poorly a couple times before it really impacts you. But here at church, we, we don't always get that luxury. Because can, we can really hurt people if we don't do things well. And if we have an irresistible community, if we as a community are, are, are saying, what is it we need to do to be irresistible? You know, think about and imagine, okay, how many, just the opposite of hurting people, I guess. There's not an eloquent way to put it. But just having a space where people come in and they get loved. Okay, I'm going to move on here. Um, what does it take to create an irresistible community? How, do we, how would we build that? If we think that that's a good thing to have, how would we build that in our church here? An irresistible community is made of irresistible people. So a community is going to reflect the people that are in it. So if it's a bunch of not-so-nice people, then you're probably not going to have a not-so-nice community. So if you enter into a place, a business, a church a gathering, a run club, wh whatever it is, uh, you know, a paddle court. Who likes paddle? We've got a bunch of crazy, passionate <clears throat> people about paddling here. You know, if you jump on the court with that community, are they friendly? Are they, are they nice? But the people impact the community. So in order to have an irresistible community, 
we need to have something to be irresistible about, and that is generally made up of the people that are in it. So how do we become irresistible people? How, how, and again, let me go back to the motivation behind all of this. None of this message matters. No, none of what I say counts or matters or means anything in the world unless you can sit there and say that I think that there is value in us creating an irresistible community. And what is valuable about it being irresistible is that it's inviting, that people want to come in and they want to be a part of it. Because we're either going to create one of two things. We're either going to be irresistible and calling people in, or instead we're going to repel people. And when people are going to come in, they're going to meet a nice person, a bad person, they're going to get hurt. But, but if we want to do that, then the rest of this message matters. If, if you're not interested in that, then you can sit back and relax and, and take a nap. But if we're looking at an irresistible community being made up of irresistible people, who's the most irresistible person? It's not your wife, men. Yeah. Who's, yeah. Ladies, it's not your husband. That's a hard one, you know. Who's more irresistible than that? I think the most irresistible person in all of history is this guy, Jesus. Now, there's, I have evidence for this. There's a ton of evidence for this in the Bible. But he is the most irresistible person that ever, ever existed. So if we just look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I've got a table for you here. There's 19 individual scriptures here, 19 references about Christ. And in every single one of these references, it says the same phrase over and over and over and over again. And it says that they were brought to him. Everywhere that Jesus went, people were brought to him because he was irresistible. Because people thought, this man has something good for me. This man, I can take my, my uh, sick, I can take my broken, I can take um, you know, anything that I have that needs to be healed, I can take to this guy. And if he just touches me, then I'll be healed. And so everywhere Jesus went, People brought their sick, brought their lame, brought their afflicted. They brought them out to Jesus. And, and that's just the 19 references. Here it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. And in fact, Jesus, the, the way that we get to the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus is trying to teach his disciples stuff. And, and people start to gather and gather and gather. And so Jesus starts teaching all of them. And there's 5,000 men and even more with women and children. And they all flocked and came because Jesus was irresistible. They wanted to know what this guy had to say. People, even, even his enemies found him irresistible. The Pharisees, they hated Jesus. But they were obsessed with him. They couldn't get enough of him. They just wanted to follow him around and hear what he had to say. And yeah, they were trying to trap him. And, but... but Jesus was pursued by everybody. He, he is, I believe, the most irresistible person. Now, if we're going to create an irresistible community, and if we're going to try and be irresistible people, and if Jesus was the most irresistible person, then we should try and be like Jesus. And in fact, that's a command. That it's not a suggestion. It's not encouragement, but it's an actual commandment that God has given us and that, that Christ actually gave to us is that we're to try and be like him. So he tells us very clearly, this is how you are to be like me and this is what will make you an irresistible person. In Matthew 22, you've got in verse 34, you've got the greatest commandment. So Jesus is asked by a scholar, uh, a lawyer who was an expert in Mosaic law, and so they're about to ask Jesus a question about the commandments. And the guy that's going to ask him this question is an expert in the laws around the commandments. And so uh, they think that they're going to trick Jesus because they're going to ask him, Okay, Jesus, which one of the commandments is more important than the others? Which one's greater than the others? And I like to think that because he's asking this question, he already has an answer figured out. And I think that this lawyer thinks that it's a complicated answer. Because I think that he thinks that this answer has got to be so specific that if Jesus just errs on one side or the other, if he picks one thing over another thing, then boom, got him. He'll be, he'll be wrong. We'll be able to expose him. We'll be able to expose this guy. 
And so this guy is thinking he's smart. He's going to set Christ up here and, and, and foil him. He's going to be, ah, see, I told you, Jesus put this over this, and I can show you how this isn't true, and you shouldn't do that, and Jesus' ministry will come crumbling down. But he, there's a surprise for him here. It turns out the answer is not that complicated. But in verse 34, the Pharisees heard that he, Jesus, had silenced or muzzled the Sadducees, and they gathered together. One of them, a lawyer who was an expert in Mosaic law, he asked Jesus a question, and he wants to test him. He says, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, the, the, the things that Jesus could pick from were like, thou shalt not covet you know, your neighbor's wife, thou shalt not murder, uh, thou shalt come to church on time in the morning, you know, things like that. And so those commandments, that's what he's asking about. And Jesus responds, he's got just a, a brilliant answer for him. Jesus says in the next verse, he says, And Jesus replied to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. You know what it doesn't say here? It doesn't say, I would encourage you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. It doesn't say, it would be a good idea for you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. See, uh, for, for the next little bit, I'm going to speak to the Christ followers that are in the room. If you are not a Christ follower, if you've never given your life to Jesus, or you don't follow Jesus, then I, you just get to sit back and relax. And, and for you, I hope that maybe you can hear what would be a priority if you were a Christ follower, if you were to make a decision to follow Jesus, this is how easy Jesus makes it for us. But, but this is what would be a priority that we would hope that you would, that, that you would be able to believe in as a, as a Christ follower. But for those of you, now this is, I think this is the majority of us, if you're a follower of Christ, this is, this is not a suggestion. This is a command. So the question is, which of the commandments is the greatest? And Jesus says, well, it's that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest. Okay, there's the first. What about the second? See, he only asked for one. Jesus gives him, bon he gives him a bonus, bonus points here. In verse 39, he says, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor. Everyone say neighbor. neighbor. You shall love your neighbor. Who does it mean when it talks about a neighbor here? It's the person that it's anybody that you're doing life alongside. It could be the, it could be the, the petrol station attendant. It could be the, the guy that's doing the checkout at the airport in Joburg while you're traveling. It's, it's anybody that you're, that's in your general vicinity or that you're living a life with. Basically, Jesus is saying we're all neighbors. It's, it's everybody. There's no one that's exempt from this. I, I, can't, I can't go, you know, I can't stand 100 meters away from my wife and say mean things to her and be like, well, neighbor stops at 99 and I'm 100. So I, now that I'm one meter over, I can say whatever I want. It's not, it's not what Jesus is talking about here. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. And he clarifies because he knows that we're bad at loving ourselves. And so he says, that is to unselfishly seek the best or higher good for others. I want you to seek the best for others. Yeah, I, going back to Nelson Mandela's quote, where he talks about if we have a fundamental concern for our in, an ind, for individuals and for a community, that fundamental concern for our community is this right here. Jesus is saying, unselfishly seek the best or the higher good for others. And the whole law and the writings of the prophets depend on these two commandments. The whole law. The writings of everything. So what, what that tells me is, um, you know, one of the commandments is thou shalt not murder. All right? M murder is wrong. Murder is bad. And it says thou shalt not murder. And now that commandment is dependent on this commandment of love God and love your neighbor. So what that tells me is that this commandment to love God and to love your neighbor and love others, it, it's, it's overarching. It rides above all the others. But for some reason, we don't choose to apply that to our lives all that much. And in and, and John 13 here, it says in verse 34, this is another presentation of the greatest commandment. 
I'm giving you a new commandment. Commandment, not suggestion, not, not, not encouragement, uh, not idea for you to ponder or consider. A new commandment. In the same way that he commands you not to, com- not to commit murder, he is commanding you to do this. It's not, here's the Ten Commandments, don't murder, don't be, don't, you know, don't, it's not, here's the Ten Commandments, and then here's this Jesus idea over here off to the side. No, he's saying that this commandment here is actually the most important one. It's the first one, and everything else flows out from under it. So if we don't fulfill this commandment, if we're not able to do this, it's like breaking all the rest of the ten. And he says, I'm going to give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, so you too are to love one another. And by this, by this love that you show for each other, by this affectionate love, by wanting the best for others, by unselfishly considering others. It's by that love for others that everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you have love and unselfish concern for another. See, th- this is a command for us, but for some reason, I, I think, and this is myself included in here, we, we choose to push this off to the side. That we, we choose when we can apply this and when we cannot apply this. It's like we've got this idea that we're entitled to an exemption here. That we don't actually have to follow this all the time. That if I'm having a bad day and I'm upset or I wake up late and things aren't going well for me, that yeah, I don't have to be loving. I don't have to unselfishly seek the best for my neighbor. I can be a bit of a jerk. You know, sorry, you know. Uh, hey, listen, I'm really sorry that I was, you know, mean to you. I'm sorry that I was upset and, you know, that I came across that way. But, you know, I was tired. You know, the Bible doesn't say, hey, when you're not tired, love yourself and then love your neighbor. It's a commandment. But somehow, some way, in, in, in our society, and by society I mean like everybody, not just this church, not the internet, not South Africa, but like kind of like everybody globally, everyone around the world, we have, have come up with ways that we can say, no, we're exempt to this. And we're talking about building an irresistible community. In order to build an irresistible community, we have to give up our self-entitled you know, right that we think that we have to declare an exemption towards loving our neighbor or loving another person or even loving ourselves. But we as the church, if we don't do this, then we're leaving the world to do this. And Jesus is saying, I want you to be a light to the world. I want you, Christ follower. I want you, Christian. I want you, the person that gave your life to Jesus, you that were baptized, you that that come to church on Sunday mornings, I want you to be a light into the world. And in order for you to be a light into the world, then you've got to have a heart to follow after Christ. And we have that heart, but we take it and we say, but it doesn't count today, or it doesn't count right now. Now, we wonder why so many people you know, are, are walking around and they're hurting and they're hurt. It's because we're missing this community. We're missing this, this idea that Jesus was trying to teach of what is it to love yourself and what is it to go and love your neighbor. What is an irresistible community like? We should all be walking around all day, every day as ambassadors, as community ambassadors, that when you interact with me, you're interacting with what it would be like to interact with the entire community. You know, I would hate for people to judge the community of this church based on even my own actions at times. On Friday night, uh, I take my son Lifa. We, we have youth here. We have Inside Out, which is our high school program. And after that's done, it's around 9.30, we go down to the petrol station. We go down to Crispy Chicken. Any Crispy Chicken fans in here over by Howard Center? Yeah. That's uh, good. It's very good. It's better than KFC. And so we go down to Crispy Chicken, and, and Leafa gets uh, the Friday special, which is basically like five kilograms worth of chips. And, and ch- I mean, it's like massive. It's, it's huge. And then, they, you know, they say, what sauce do you want? And they, I mean, it is just, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. It takes two hands to carry it. That's why I'm doing this here. And he gets that. And on Friday, we go up to the counter to order. It's like 930 at night. And we go up to the counter to order, and the guy behind the counter, he says, "Uh, hey, how's it going, pastor? And I was like, oh, man, one more person knows what I do. So that's one more petrol station. I got to just, can't, you know, I can't yell at anybody in here. (laughs) Can't get upset, can't get frustrated, you know. 
And, and, and that, that just like, I, I'm, I try and be very cognizant of it. That everywhere I go, even though I may not know it, people know me and they know what I do. And they know where I come from. And they know whether it's fair or unfair, but my actions can have an impact on all of us as a community here in the church. There could be an exorbitant amount of good things happening out there, and I could go out and with one or two actions discredit everything that God is doing in here. See, this, this is why it's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. It's a commandment to discipline our hearts to follow Christ. It's a commandment to discipline our hearts and discipline our tongue and discipline our mind and our attitude and even discipline our physical actions that we represent Christ well. And when Christ gave the command, he could have said, here's 10 things you need to do. Here's 15 things to do. Here's the top three things you need to do. No, he didn't. He made it very, very simple for us. And he said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, body. Just love God with everything that you are and everything that you have. And then go love your neighbor as well. You know, he, he made it so that we would connect on, on that heart level. That it's, it's not a, a head knowledge area. of If I do these seven things right and I tick the boxes, then we're an irresistible community. Or I'm an irresistible person. Or, or I'm following Jesus. I'm doing the right thing. And Jesus is saying, you're not entitled to any exemption from this church. Hey, Christ follower, there is no exemption to this command. This is a command. It's, 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 it's not optional. You are to love God and you are to love others. And that means that we've got to, we've got to take some ownership of that. We've got to be held. There's some accountability that we need to take for that. But, but it's, it's worth it. It's worth it. You know, if I, if I go back to thinking that when we leave here now, you know, if, if all 100, 100 of you walk out of here now as ambassadors for an irresistible community, and you have 100 different interactions, then now you've got 200 people that have experienced the love and the goodness of God. You know, it, it, it's, it can be an exponential thing that we have, but in this community... And this is why I think Christ spoke about community. This is why President Mandela spoke about community, is that there is so much impact or potential impact in us acting as a community. We can do great things individually, but we can do even more as a community. We can have even more impact as a collection of people that are united around something. And so if we unite around the love of Jesus, and then we go out there, we interact with people, I mean, it's endless as to what could happen. But there, there's a person out there, or maybe even in here, that needs an encounter with Jesus. But Jesus is scary, and church is scary. And committing to something like this is scary. Coming, sitting in a dark room and listening to all this, this, this could be a very scary thing. But what's not scary is a, hey, hello, how are you? Hey, can I get you a cup of coffee? Hey, tell me how your week went this week. Hey, you want to get together and just chat about life? Hey, why don't you come over for a bri? Like that, that's not scary. That's relationship building. That, that's being an irresistible community, pulling people in, loving on them, and then letting God take it from there. We, we've got to give up the right, our self Kind of, we've got to give up our self ascribed right for entitlement to this exemption. The, the truth is that we're not the first humans to face a tough share the earth with each other situation. A lot of the challenges that we have today, racially, politically, economically, socially, we, they are not unique to us. I, I think every generation thinks that it is. Every, um, everybody that thinks. There's people out there, and I love them, God bless them, but they always think that the world is ending because there's prophecy being fulfilled. And they'll say, you know, oh, well, th- this happened, and, you know, the, the, the Pope uses left hand instead of his right hand, so that means that the ho- seven horsemen are coming, and this and that. And there's, there's all these I- ideas around that. And, and everyone kind of thinks that what's happening now is unique to right now, to us right now, like it's never happened before. And that's just 
that's not the case. And especially in what we're talking about here, our, our life issues around racism, around social issues, around injustice, around econ economic problems, around all of those things are not just unique to us. They've been going on for a long time. And Jesus uses a parable to show us this. So we're going to be looking in Luke chapter 10 here. And Jesus is going to tell a parable. He's going to talk about uh, Jewish people and then Samaritans. Talk about Samaria, uh, Samaria. Now, to give you a little context on this, you had uh, the United Kingdom of Israel. And so if you're, if you're new to church, think about this. Uh, let's go back to Moses. When Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, you know, Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh eventually, after a few plagues, lets the people go. And then those people escape out of Egypt. And those are God's chosen people. That's the nation of Israel. And eventually they get their own land. And they create their own little country. And then eventually that country would split into two. You'd have the northern kingdom. You'd have the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom would become Judea. And its capital would be the city of Jerusalem. Now we've heard of Jerusalem. That's David's city. It's all over the Bible. And the north, the northern kingdom of Israel... Its capital would be Samaria. So you've got Samaria in the northern kingdom, and you've got uh, Jerusalem and Judea in the southern kingdom. And those two people hated each other. Can you guess why they didn't like each other? Well, it had everything to do with race and politics and all of that stuff. In fact, <clears throat> when the Assyrians came in, the Persians came in, the Assyrians came in. They conquered, they just smashed Samaria to bits. They conquered north, the northern kingdom completely. And when they did, they carted a bunch of people away. So they took a, a lot of their population out and got rid of them. And they brought in a lot of people called Gentiles, so non-Jewish people. And the Samaritans, they were Jewish people, just like those in Jerusalem. But what they did is they kind of ignored the fact that they were Jewish in order to fit in, in order to uh, kind of like survive or make it through with the Assyrians. And so then they intermarried with them. And then they still claimed that they were Jewish. And so then the, the proper, you know, quote unquote, Jews in the South were saying, you're not Jewish, we're Jewish. You have let people into the bloodline. You've married, intermarried with non-Jews. And so now it becomes a, a, a racial thing, a religious thing. You're not like us. You're different from us. You're mixed. You're not pure like we are. And those two, they hated each other with passion. In fact, they built roads around each other's country so that they wouldn't even have to walk through each other's section of country. They did not like each other. And Jesus gets an opportunity to tell this parable. And when he's telling this parable, he's telling this parable to Jewish people. And to tell a parable to Jewish people about Samaritans would be about the most controversial that Jesus could get. And so let's look at what he says here. Jesus replied. He's, he's teaching here. And he, he replies to a question. And he says, okay, listen here. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he encountered robbers. These robbers, they stripped him of his clothes and belongings, and they beat him, and they went along their way, unconcerned, leaving him for half dead. So here's what Jesus is doing with these guys. He's telling the story to. He, he's using uh, local context for this here. So to go from Jerusalem to Jericho, you went downhill because Jerusalem is higher in elevation. And so he's saying to go down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And now just imagine those that are around him that he's teaching. They're saying, okay, yeah, I've been on that road. Yeah, I know that road. Yeah, you start here and you go there. And it's about 30 kilometers, 17 miles from Jerusalem to Jericho. And it's primarily downhill. And it's primarily like a, a single track trail. And to be robbed on that journey, which you would rarely ever, if ever, make that journey on your own, kind of sounds like, you know, where we live, and you would, you would never make that journey on your own, or else you could get robbed, and people would rob you and steal your stuff. Specifically, they would take your clothes, because clothes were really, really valuable. To have two sets of clothing was a valuable thing. And so as Jesus is telling this parable here, so far, just one verse in, everybody that's listening is like, yeah, okay, yeah, you know, my Uncle Ted went through that, you know. Uh, they should really put Zone Watch up on the hill there. Everyone should have their panic buttons, you know, uh, working. And, you know, because I can't believe the crime that's happening here. 
So Jesus begins this parable, and they're saying, okay, yeah, we can relate to this completely. And then in verse 31, he says, now by coincidence, a priest, hypothetically, let's all just imagine, a priest is going on the same journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. And when he sees the guy that had been beaten, that had been robbed, had his clothes stripped off of him, the priest passes by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, who's like a priest, also comes down, sees this guy on the side of the road, and he passes by on the other side of the road. What jerks, right? Horrible, horrible people that did that. It's easy to judge them, but I want you to think about this. So uh, this guy that would have been robbed had his clothes stripped off of him. He was left for dead on the side of the road. He was in a state that has a translation that is, is quite literally translates as half dead. Now, a priest had an obligation that he could not do things that would cause him to become unclean. Because if he was unclean, he couldn't go to the temple. And if he couldn't go to the temple, then he couldn't intercede uh, with God on behalf of the people. And so a priest had to keep himself clean. He could not compromise his state. And so as he walks down, if this had been a man that was just injured, and it was obvious that he was just injured, the priest could have come down and could have poked him with a stick and said, hey man, are you okay? Hey, let me help you out. And there was actually a mercy law that would allow for this to happen within the Jewish culture. But if the guy was dead, that if he even got close to him, he would become unclean. So that's why he goes on the other side of the road. So it's easy to judge this guy until you learn a little bit about his context. Now the Levite didn't have as many rules applied to him, but still some. The Levite chooses to do the same thing. I've got to keep clean. I, I can't become dirty by this person. But then the third person that comes along has no obligation to any of this. This is the Samaritan, which at this point, when Jesus said Samaritan, everybody would have just gasped. Okay, can you guys give me your best, like, <gasps> like yeah, yeah, it's the, okay. So uh, when I say Samaritan, you gasp. But a Samaritan, I know, I know, I can't believe it. A foreigner who was traveling came upon him and when he saw him, he was deeply moved with compassion for him. And all the Jews are saying, but Jesus, he has no emotions. How can he be deeply moved for him? You know, that's, I mean, they, they th saw the Samaritans as dogs, as mongrels. And so Jesus is super controversial here. He says, he, this Samaritan, he goes to him and he bandages up his wounds. So he touches the guy. So now he's unclean. Well, he was unclean to begin with. He's like a dog, so it's fine. He pours oil and wine on it, and, and this oil was used to keep germs out, and the wine was used in, as an antiseptic to clean, you know, to clean a wound. And then he goes on, he does even more for this guy. And then the next verse here, it says that he put, him, put on him his own pack animal, and he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. Can you believe that? See, see, the person that walked in front of the donkey would have been the slave. It would have been the less than. But the, the Samaritan, he walks in front of the donkey because he put the injured guy on the donkey. Can you believe that? A Samaritan did something nice like that? That's crazy. And then on the next day, he puts his money where his mouth is. And he gives two denarii. And he gives it to them, the innkeeper. And he says, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I return. And then in verse 36 here, this is the way this whole thing closes. Which of these three do you think proved himself a neighbor? A neighbor to the man who encountered the robbers. Let's go back to the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment is to love God and to love your neighbor. So who's your neighbor? It's all of us. See, if we look at this idea of the priest and the Levite didn't go near the half-dead guy because they felt like they had to stay clean. The Samaritan had no obligation to stay clean. So he just went right for the aid and right for the help. Guess who else doesn't have an obligation to be clean by our own works? It's us. We don't have that. You see, when Jesus came and he died on the cross for us, Remember, I'm speaking to Christ followers here. When he died on the cross for you, he made you clean. There's nothing that can separate you from God. The priests and the Levite, they were worried they would be separated from God. Even, even if they had the best intentions, that was their fear. 
the Samaritan wasn't afraid of that. And we don't have to be afraid of that either. See, when you take away our own ideas of self-preservation, our own ideas of what it means for us to be clean, our own ideas of what, you know, what deserves our attention, what deserves our help, or how far are you really willing to go to help somebody in your community, when you take all that away, then you're left with the Samaritan. And that, just would have, that, that was mind-boggling to these guys when Jesus tells this here. See, we, we have the same opportunity when we look at what kind of community do we want to build. Now, I've, I've got, there's two groups of us out here, and I want to give each of you something to do to apply this message to. The, the first group is those of you that are already in a community. Maybe it's a community group, maybe it's friends, maybe it's a work community, whatever it is. I want you to analyze and assess whether or not you are an irresistible community. Are you taking care of each other? See, guys, we have an option here to change. To cha- I mean, we literally have an option to change the world. But we also have the option to change one world. There is, there is a person that needs Jesus. There's a person that's been robbed, that's been beat up, that's been left for dead. You know who's left for dead? Everybody that doesn't have Christ is left for dead. And those are all people that Jesus is saying, go be an irresistible community. Do you want to hang out with a bunch of priests? Or do you want to hang out with a bunch of the Samaritans? I would rather be with a bunch of Samaritans. As the way that Jesus explained it in this parable. And we can create that community. But the first thing I'm asking you to do is to look at your community. And ask yourself the question, are we irresistible? And if you're not, all you need to do is say, God... How do I love you with all my heart, soul, and mind, and then show me how to love my neighbor? Show me what I need to take care of in myself so that I can love my neighbor better. And if you're not in a group, the second category of you out there is, if you're not in a community, then I would ask that you join one. Join a community one way or another. It doesn't have to be a traditional small group. If it is, great. We have those here. We can plug you in. But don't do life alone. Join a community. And then as you join this community, I want you to join with the intention of let's be be irresistible. Let's be absolutely irresistible. Now, I'm going to close this off uh, in prayer. And in doing so, I'm going to ask God to finish this sermon. I'm going to ask Him to finish this message. Uh, I feel like that, well, I not feel, I know that this came from God, that God put this This idea of community and the Samaritan. He put that on my heart and he put that together. And that he put in us a a reminder that we are commanded to be irresistible. We're commanded to go out into love. We're commanded to be an irresistible community because we lead with love. And I'm going to let God take kind of where I end here and him continue to speak to you about whether or not you want to join in something like this or whether or not you can look within yourself and say, what do I need to do in me to be more irresistible or to love others? What do I need to do to get rid of that self-entitled exemption that I apply to different areas of my life? So let's bow our heads and close our eyes as we pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you continue the message. I pray, Father, that you pick up where I've left off. God, I've done my part and now I'd desperately, desperately need you to do your part. Lord, speak to people in this room. Move throughout this room. Call everybody to you that needs to come to you. Put on people's minds, their hearts. Uh, Speak to them, Lord. Uh, Just give them a healthy and a good uh, life-giving conviction of areas where they can uh, look at their communities and say, Lord, how do we be irresistible? Father, I pray that you put at least one thing in everybody's heart this morning that's here, that leads them to becoming more and more irresistible like you've called us to be. And Father, we do all of this because we just want to be what you've asked us to be for the benefit of those that don't know you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can.